In this video, we will discuss duration mismatch and the savings and loan fiasco. The savings and loan fiasco was one of three major banking crises in the United States in the last hundred years. This graph shows the year and the number of bank failures. You can see a large number of bank failures during the Great Depression and also a large number of bank failures during the recent financial crisis. The savings and loan fiasco was this large number of bank failures that occurred in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The cause of the savings and loan fiasco was what we will call duration mismatch. The general accounting equation is assets equal liabilities plus equity, so equity equals assets minus liabilities, or the change in equity equals the change in assets minus the change in liabilities. For a savings and loan or a bank, assets are generally long-term loans. Savings and loans were legally restricted to only be able to invest in 30-year fixed-rate home loans. Their liabilities were passbook accounts. At this point in time, savings and loans couldn't even issue checking accounts. To value a long-term loan, it's basically valued like a bond, except each payment is the same as they amortize on out. So assets, is this the present value of a series of payments, or each payment is the monthly home loan? For a typical fixed rate 30-year home loan, you have 360 payments, one per month for 30 years. We'll consider a house with a monthly payment of 1,000, and after all the payments are made, the future value is zero. If we value a home loan in this way, Using our standard annuity equation, present value of A13, where A13 is going to be our monthly interest rate. F3 is the N, our number of payments. F4 is the thousand, our monthly payment. And F5 is zero after the annuity is paid off. So these we will keep constant, and we will allow the interest rate A13 to vary. We will start out with an interest rate of zero, go up to an interest rate of 0.1, or an interest rate of 1%, 2%, 3%, and this is on a yearly basis. If you divide that by 12, we get the interest rate on a monthly basis. And we look at all these changes in interest rates. The value of this asset to the bank then is going to go down as interest rates go up. 360,000 if there's no interest rate, if everything is free. As interest rates increase up here to around 5%, 166,000, 105,000 at 11%, etc. And therefore, the value of the assets, which is our red line here, will go down as interest rates increase. So for a typical savings and loan, let's say we had a 5% interest rate, we had the value of a loan at $186,000 being backed by 100,000. So equity, again, is going to be assets minus liabilities, the asset to the bank, minus the passbook accounts in the bank, leaving 86,000 in equity deposited in the bank. Most banks actually don't have this much equity. As interest rates go up, we would then see the value of the equity plummets down to zero, in this case, at 12%. So look at, let's look at interest rates historically in the United States. Going back to the 1950s, we had relatively low interest rates. Here we're looking at the Fed funds rate, or the interest rate that the central bank sets short-term rates. And in the 50s, things were relatively low. During the 1960s, the United States engaged in both the Vietnam War and in Lyndon Bay Johnson, the Great Society program. They didn't really have any way of paying for this, so what the U.S., of course, did was they printed a lots of money. If you print lots of money, inflation tends to go up, which is exactly what occurred. In an effort to somewhat fight the inflation, the Fed started raising interest rates, and throughout the 70s started bouncing them back and forth. Um, before the 1970s, the U.S. was also involved in something called the Bretton Woods Agreement. After World War II, all of the major currencies in the world were tied to the U.S. dollar, 
and the U.S. dollar was tied to gold at $35 per ounce. Um, if a foreign government wished to, they could take their dollars to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York and exchange them for gold. The French did this multiple times, and eventually the U.S. ran out of gold because they'd printed more dollars than they had to gold to back it, and therefore the U.S. defaulted on the Bretton Woods Agreement when Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard in 71. This did not deter the U.S. from printing more and more money, as it continued to do throughout the 70s. We can see fluctuations in interest rates here as they sort of fought inflation. And then finally, Paul Volcker went to a major effort to fight inflation after he was appointed by Jimmy Carter in 1979, raising short-term rates up to close to 20%. But of course, as interest rates go up, banks and savings and loans borrow short-term, lend long-term. Therefore, if they had made a 30-year fixed-rate home loan back here in the 50s, they would still have it on the books at this time period, and the value of that asset would plummet. This caused the mass bankruptcies of the savings and loans in the 80s and 90s. So the savings and loan fiasco was caused by too much leverage at the banks, which is allowed under the Basel Accords. Most banks only have 5 to 10% in equity. And then government printing to finance debt, eventually resulting in the default on the gold standard and huge short-term interest rates. The solutions that the banks came up with this, the major one was securitization, where rather than a bank keeping the loans on its own books, it merely sold it out to somebody else. So they would more like be a Walmart of loans. They would issue a loan for a home and then sell it and then issue another loan. So they wouldn't have to keep much in the way of equity to back the loans. Another way that they could deal with this risk is called a plain vanilla interest rate swap, where they would swap out their fixed rate home loans for a floating rate loan. Um, this topic will be discussed in a later video. And as we know, the securitization solution that they came up with to solve the savings and loan fiasco helped contribute to the next financial crisis in the early 2000s. Since if the bank no longer keeps the loan on its books, it's not nearly as concerned about the credit value of the loan. If you would like to learn more about these topics, I have a series of articles on them with the Foundation for Economic Education, which can be found at this link here. Thank you for watching this video.